Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ryan Ride Mechanic channel. How the heck are you doing today? On today's video, I've got something that was sent around to me by actually a lot of people that everyone said, hey, check this out, you need to see this. Uh, so they sent me a video that is going to swing and kind of turn everything upside down. So let's talk about getting stuck upside down real quick. Now get ready, here we go. First of all, welcome to the channel. If this is your first time here, make sure you like and subscribe. Do all the stuff below, that does really help me out. For those of you returning, welcome back. I appreciate you watching another video. Okay, today's video, I wanted to talk about this video going around that it basically shows a ride stuck upside down. So the description on this video says 28 people trapped upside down on an amusement park ride, the Atmosphere, spelled F-E-A-R. More than two dozen people are recovering after a theme park ride in Oregon left them hanging upside down for more than 20 minutes. On Friday, June 14th, 28 passengers were riding on Portland's Oaks Amusement Park's Atmosphere at around 2.55 p.m. when the ride stopped in its place suspending them all upside down on its apex position. Let's take a look at that video. So we were riding a ride. Um, this isn't supposed to be upside down like this. It's been like that for like already two to three minutes. Everyone I feel bad for them because all the power is shut off on it too right now. This is scary. All right, update. They're still up there. It's been about five minutes, maybe a little bit more. And they've just been hanging up there this whole time. Yeah, we, we, uh, we just asked the lady at the bottom of the Ferris wheel if this has ever happened before, and she said no, and she said she's actually concerned for them. Oh, they just said Oaks Park. They just said the park is closed. Jesus Christ. They just said... Vacate the park immediately. We're going to have to get down. Holy fuck. That is actually fucking terrifying. Jesus Christ, I hope those people are okay. All right, so that was the aftermath. Let's take a look at what the ride looks like in motion. So here's the actual event where it happened. Let's watch this. Let's go back with this one and watch it again and let's uh, look at some key parts here and we're going to try to dissect what's going on. So the first time it shows it going over, it was powered, it's going over and then I'm assuming right around here it probably goes down and does some sort of an overspeed and trips into a fault. Now from that point forward it's not powered, it's actually just coasting but because it barely made it over it was coasting, it was coasting, and now the rotational part's still going, but the arm has stalled. So this is this means the drive's not being powered up at the top. So this happens when the main rotational drive, the, the drives that push the arm around, those guys can fault and stop moving. And then right here, where the gondola stopped spinning, Basically, what I think happened is that at that point, the ride operator either hit a ride stop or an e-stop. So, typically on these things, what you have is that the gondola 
has a giant counterweight on the other side that reduces the amount of energy that the motors need to actually push the gondola and get it back around. So here's a small screen capture I got of an aerial shot from this as well. Um, if you could see right here, up on top, this is the motor platform. This is a, a pretty grainy picture that what I got, sorry, don't have something that's much better. Um, but you can't see it well up here, but basically there's typically two really large drive motors, one on each side of that arm. And then up at the top right here, there's a big counterweight that helps offset the weight of the gondola on the other side down here. So what's going on is that I believe this thing was rotating, faulted, and then the drives cut out. And it just so happened anything that rotates on these flat rides where they spin and go 360 degrees, there's a chance they can stop upside down. Not a great chance, but the chance is there. And the fact that that's all the ride does is spit, sit there and spin in a circle, your chances of getting stuck upside down are much higher than if you were, let's say, going on a roller coaster and you had a, a wheel carrier or something break apart which caused the ride to mechanically stop out on the track and it just so happened to be in a loop. We've actually seen that before on some rides, but uh, the chance is extremely rare on that because you have so many other points in the track you could stop, but in this case you have a little window that sits right at the very top of something that could stop. So. What sets this apart from most other failures and the reason why it was a problem is because of the recovery time. Well, they were stuck upside down for 30 minutes. Okay, so the ride itself, I have experience working on a Zamprilla Giant Discovery, which is actually made by Soriani, probably saying that name wrong. This ride was actually manufactured by a manufacturer called Technical Park. Although it looks like a Zamprilla giant discovery, it's not. Um, so one of the things that we don't know on this ride is how it reacts or how it tries to drive itself over the top. A lot of times what these rides do is they will swing on a profile and they will get the gondola up so far and then the motor ramps way back down. But like never off, but it ramps down. So what they do is as it's swinging towards the bottom, they're putting like 100% energy into it and 100% torque. And as the arm comes back up around the top, that energy and torque start to go way off. They start to go off to the point where once it gets up towards the top, it'll either continue on its way over or it will slow down, at which point the motors detect it slowing down and they will try to continue the torque back up, 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 up until it pushes it over or has to change direction and go back the other way. So what happened up here is I'm guessing, just a guess, that there is a slot inside the program right there at the top that says, hey, if you're up here in this narrow little window at the top, let's say like a five degree window, if you're up there, we're gonna continue the motor going at a minimal torque, like hardly anything to one side, and we're just gonna keep it pushing just in case it just needs to go over the top to the other side. But up that high, that much of a balance, it should just need just a little tiny push to keep it going. So the manufacturer said, okay, we're either gonna cut the motor completely out there, or we're going to just keep it going ever slow slightly on the way up around the top. And then what happened is it went up there and it wasn't sitting at quite zero, but it was maybe sitting a degree or two off or the encoder that reads the arm position was also a degree or two off and it thought it was someplace where it wasn't. I mean, a degree or two at the end of a 50, 60 foot arm is still pretty big ways. I mean, that's, that's probably, you know, seven, 10 feet up at the very top if it's just one degree. Um, didn't do the math for it, but you could do the math, radius, diameter, all that stuff, mark it out in degrees. Um, so what I'm thinking happened is it went up there and the motor either slowed down to a stop or stopped completely right there. And it just so happened to catch it in that one spot where maybe that drive motor was on and continuing to run. 
Now, I originally thought it was a fault. It went around that first time and on the way around it faulted and then it would have continued back around that first loop and then the second time came back around would have perfectly stalled up there. The only thing in my mind that goes against that is that typically when you fault a ride out and you say there's a drive fault shut off, you typically shut off everything. Now, in this case, when it went up there, the gondola was still spinning. You could see as it went back around the second time through that the gondola is still spinning. If you look at that, see, the arm's now perfectly straight up and down and the gondola is still rotating. That means, that really tells me, after looking at it, that the ride still thinks it's okay. And it didn't know what to do because it didn't think that there was a problem. But at this point, the ride operator's like, uh-oh, there's a problem, and they hit the stop button right there, either stop or e-stop or something like that, and hit it right there. Now, the next question that everyone's going to ask, which is completely understandable, is would you hit the e-stop in that scenario? Well, on these big pendulum-style rides like this, where you have a lot of weight that's wrapped up in there and it's going to swing from side to side a lot, um, typically on these rides, we don't hold the motors at all. We let them just stay open and free. And the reason why we do that is because that motor goes through a planetary drive gearbox and then into a giant ring gear, typically one on both sides, that way it drives it evenly. Um, the giant discoveries actually used four motors up there, two on each side, and then drove the thing around. So what would happen is that is that when you lock up the brake on the back of the motor while that arm is out there, you take that brake force and amplify it all the way through the gearbox into that giant ring gear, and then you could start braking components up there, and you could start putting stress on the arm. You imagine this big lever sitting out there. Well, if you applied the braking force right here, then out here, all this stress just kind of like, and then you have a lot of stress in this area right there. So you don't want to do that. You want to let that arm naturally just come to a stop. For those people that have worked these rides or if you've been around one and seen one, when they fault out, if you do have to e-stop it, they continue to swing for a long time because you're just waiting for that momentum to just naturally slow itself back down and get down to the bottom. They're good at swinging. They're built for swinging, so they take a long time to stop there. From what I heard... This ride also did the same thing. Once they did get it pushed in one direction, or I believe maintenance figured it out and got the ride recovered right as the fire department showed up. So they said, oh, the fire department got there, but realistically maintenance figured out how to get the ride unstuck. And then fire department showed up at the same time, which became just, okay, let's manually open the restraints at the bottom, get the people off. So... E-stopping the ride essentially does nothing. It shuts that rotation of the gondola, it shuts it down, but it doesn't do anything else. So there's no brakes being applied. In fact, for like the Giant Discovery, the brakes actually needed air pressure, if I remember that properly. The brakes needed air pressure to apply, but they could only apply when the gondola was all the way down, dead center on the bottom. And you say, well, how does it know it's dead center on the bottom? It has a angular encoder, angular position, absolute encoder, whatever you want to call it. It knows the degrees, 360 exactly where it is, and down to the seconds. They know very finite where that thing is. And the manufacturer gave it this little tiny window to park in. So it needed the encoder to say that it was in that little tiny window down there. Then it needed all four drives to say all four motors were turned off and then everything else was safe. And then after all of that, the air pressure was applied to the brakes up there and it held the arm. So that was the way those brakes applied. So typically you don't hold the brakes on up there. Now this isn't the first time these rides have done this. Um, this has happened multiple times before on plenty of other rides out there. Like I said earlier, anything that swings over the top and that's all it does where it just rotates around like that, has a high likelihood to get stuck up there. Almost everything does because it's such a it's that's the only thing it's doing. It's spinning. It's got nothing else to do. So we had two rides at my park 
that did that exact same motion. One of them was a Zamperla Hawk 48. Um, that was Revision Zero, it was the prototype, uh, that and its sister in North Korea. But the Hawks had the same thing. They could take, they had big counterweights on the top of the arms, and as the arm rotated around and the gondolas were straight up and down, if you were to stop the ride up there, right as the ride was trying to change directions, just as they were perfectly straight up and down, if you hit ride stop or e-stop and killed all the power, the gondolas would just stay there because they had no mass and momentum going the other ways. You would have to time this right as they were perfectly balanced and really not moving at all or like a, like a game where you have to stop it right to where the thing drifts into the right spot, that would be it. They would be going side to side and then you hit stop right as they go stop and then they would just kind of right in dead center and stop right there. Uh, but it would get stuck upside down. The hawk actually had a brake on it that was pneumatically applied. So we had actually several procedures to go to that ride and we had we we had to go up to the top, which uh, the tower was only, I want to say about 20 feet high. It wasn't very high, but we had to hook a ladder on real quick, run up to the top, and push in a little manual override button to open the pneumatic brake. And then once that brake was open, two mechanics down at the bottom would push the arms in opposite directions because they were all linked to one gearbox. So they both turned opposite no matter what. So you just push the gondolas in opposite directions and the gondolas would start to naturally come around and they would swing back down towards the bottom and stop. Um, that happened several times before I was employed there and it happened once while I was employed there. It was one of those things, it's a oh crap moment, everyone runs out there and everyone gets it back up and running. Go up there, open the brake up. Sometimes you don't even need to do that. Uh, if rides have manual modes and stuff like that, you could simply just reset the fault, switch it in the manual mode, and start a cycle on it, and then let it start to drive one way or the other. And then once it starts and just moves the gondola out of that sweet spot, you could e-stop it again and let the thing come back down. But is it a highly photographable moment? Yes, it is. Everyone will take pictures of it. It'll wind up on the news, all of that stuff. Uh, the other one I didn't have personal experience with, but I had stories from other people. A Intamin looping ship. So the Intamin looping ships used big drive tires on the bottom, two sets of them, and a giant counterweight on top. It was a big ship, and it would swing itself over the top. And every once in a while, the same thing, since it was a complete free-spinning vehicle, which means it had no drive at all. At least, at least the one in this video had drive motors in the center, like a giant Discovery does as well. But uh, with no motion at all, once that gondola lost its momentum up there, it was up to gravity. It would either fall backwards or it would fall forwards, one side or the other. But there was the sweet spot all the way up on top that if the gondola was loaded just right and it just so happened to crawl and stop in that one little sweet spot up there, kind of like winning the lottery, it would stall and it would stop. And then they would have to go out and push the counterweight to get the thing to come back over. Now, it sounds easy, but you got to remember there's a lot going on. The counterweights on those rides weren't that high up, which means they weren't that low to the ground, so they had to work on it. Now, anytime you push any of these things, what goes up must come down. So the Giant Discovery, which they don't go 360, I just keep referencing to that because that's what that thing looks like, even though it's not the same manufacturer. But um, the Giant Discovery that Soriani built and this one by Technical Park, um, they had the drive motors off to the side. So what I would do is I would scurry up that leg really quick because a leg typically has a ladder. I would scurry up that leg basically and then grab a hold of the motor coupler itself, which you could typically get to. So the motor should be unlocked and open and basically grab that motor coupler and start trying to twist. Put myself in as the motor. And you're like, that's not really going to do anything. It's like, Actually, it might. You, your ring gear, you got to remember, your ring gear is like a 
25 to 1 ratio. So you have a lot of reduction there on it in the first place. 25 to 1, that's a lot for something that's balanced. And then on top of that, that pinion that's sitting at the bottom of the ring gear or in the middle or on the side, that is also going through a planetary drive, which is also reduced down, which is typically like 60 or 70 to 1. So actually, you could sit there, assuming the motor's not locked up, again, I don't know that exact manufacturer, and you could sit there and twist that thing like a steering wheel and get it to move one way or the other. It might be really tough to do, and if there's multiple motors, you might actually be fighting the other motor so hard, you might either need two mechanics to do it, assuming they can get up to the other leg and on that other motor. Um, so that might be pretty difficult itself. We installed a Larson loop, which is, it was one of the park models. It was one of the big 70 foot loops. And I remember, I say, okay, what's the interlocks on this thing? They said, well, the operator sits there and moves the joystick left and right. It's like, okay, that's dumb, but whatever. Uh, what about presence? What do we need? Well, on the bottom of the seat that the operator sits in, there's a limit switch. So every time you sit down, click, the limit switch turns on and that's what allows that joystick to start operation. I'm like, okay, so we required a operator presence switch to be put in. So you not only needed to put your butt in the seat, but you needed a key to say that the operator was there. And the park opted for a foot pedal as well. So now we had a limit switch on the butt, a foot pedal, an operator present key switch that was all operating at the same time while the ride was running. So what they would do is they would run that loop in three cycles one direction and three cycles the other direction. But when they stopped in between the three cycles to switch directions, they actually parked the train perfect up there. It looks kind of hard to do. It's kind of like a game, but it's actually once you get used to it, it's actually really simple. So they would park that train dead center up there and the operators would just hold them there for a while and just go uh, and watch the thing like, okay, yeah. Uh, and they'd go back around. And some operators would make more of a show out of, out of it than others. So I was always worried on that one. Like, man, what happens when the operator can't start it back up again? Not that it stopped, really. They were still had it on. It was still running the whole time. But all I pictured was operators getting up out of their seat, doing stuff, and then for some reason, the thing didn't reset. And it happened because the operator got out of their seat and to look around and do that. And then something happened with the secondary back over there um, and the gate. I want to say it was something with the gate. Something happened back over there with the, the, uh, the release gate on the back side where you would exit the ride. And when the operator sat back down and started to move it again, it wouldn't move because there was one of the safeties had dropped out and said something was wrong. But because the ride didn't have a feedback or a PLC sy system to it, we had to, they had to sit there and just hurriedly check everything. So they, they called up and said that they were stuck and it was upside down. And then, like, right after that call came out over the radio, it started moving again. And they were able to figure it out and get it going again. But that was one of those things that was like, stop messing with that thing. Just do it quick. Let it, you know, park it up there just momentarily, just enough to switch positions and let it go on its way. So when we see breakdowns like this, it's not really something so much like, um, it's not a huge safety problem. Although it was an extreme inconvenience for those guests, absolutely. Is this the time when we want to pull out the coveted, we want to start giving out dip and dots afterwards? No. Again, we don't give dip and dots out for ride breakdowns. That's just something that's not happens. Even if they're extremely inconvenienced like this. Funnel cake, sure, whatever, but not dip and dots. Don't do dip and dots. So it's one of those things that's like eventually stuff like this will happen with these rides. And... What really pokes at these things is just that park's procedure of what they do when it does happen. The park I was worked at, we had procedures worked out for when it does happen. This park didn't have a procedure for that. Or if they did, it wasn't a great procedure because that ride from the time it broke down and that operator called out, 
maintenance should have been able to recover that ride within five to ten minutes but they weren't able to took them over half an hour to do so the ride was shut down it's it listed right now on their website as temporarily closed um, which is about understandable so they're going to look into why it stopped up there in the first place but i have a feeling it just happened to be a perfect storm of events that happened nothing really majorly wrong with the ride just happened but one thing that the park should do or maybe a governing body watching that park depending on who's overseeing it is that the park should come up with the procedure to recover that gondola when it happens again because with these type of rides again it's not if it's when so when it stalls up there again they should have a better procedure to run up there and do that. So that's always the thing you have to take away from these events. It's not so much what happened during the event, it's what are you going to do the next time it happens and how are you going to prevent yourself from getting on the news again. Although I don't care who it is, what park it is, it doesn't matter. Once they've done this, once this park has done this now, the next time this happens, even if it's three years from now, it will make the news again and it will get all over the place again and people will say look it happened again that park must be horrible and all the things come out but it's just a matter of time before it does so these were just some real quick thoughts again i was getting contacted by everybody saying hey what do you think about this what's going on what would cause that realistically it's just a kind of a these things happen I, for something that's driven over like that, I think there was some sort of a fault that happened. Nothing major. It just so happened to kill that drive in the right spot. I really kind of feel that way. But then again, at the same time, with the gondola still spinning, that also kind of takes the fault theory out of it. Kind of confused on that one. It, it really depends on how the manufacturer set the ride to fault. Like they could say those swing drives that I'm talking about swing drives could have faulted and the rotational drive could have stayed on. Absolutely, the manufacturer could have it programmed that way. There's nothing wrong with that. But since I don't understand it, I'm, I'm like, when I think of fault, I think of shut everything off. But sometimes that's not the case. They still let things run because, oh, just a swing drive's fault. So just shut those off. Let everything else operate. That can work both ways to your advantage and to your disadvantage. Might be confusing sometimes when the ride breaks down, but for manufacturers that do that sort of stuff where they just shut individual components down instead of everything, well, it's kind of nice because when the gondola comes back home, you can just use the ride and open up all the restraints and get people off, as opposed to if you shut everything off, then you've lost everything in the ride, and now you have to manually do all aspects of it, which might be more of a pain in the butt. Anyways, really quick video. Hope you learned some stuff. I'm sure you have plenty of questions. Go ahead and let them go. Um, if you want to, you can email me, ryantherightmechanic at yahoo.com. I'm always available there. And make sure you like and subscribe and do all that stuff. And as always, stay off the air gates. <laughs> Bye.